Hey there, John. Hey, Glenn. This is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv. I'm nervous about this one, Glenn. I'm going to be perfect. I'm talking anyway, with John McWhorter. Let me introduce him before he runs screaming from the room. He's John McWhorter, uh, professor at Columbia University. I'm Glenn Lowry, professor at Brown University. We are the black guys at bloggingheads.tv, and we are here, and John is nervous. John, um, what's there to be nervous about? Because we've had our subject about- is affirmative action and um, Amy Wax and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that yours and my views of what she said are going to be exactly what one would expect black college professors' views to be. And so, yes, we have to tread lightly here because I think that it would be very easy to be misunderstood as Amy, and yes, I do know her, has experienced. And so, yes, let's proceed. Okay, let me start by just briefly describing, if there's anybody out there who doesn't already know uh, the background story, and then I'll allow you to uh, say, you know, what you think, and I'll chime in and we'll go from there. So Amy Wax uh, is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School back in September here at the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv in the context of a wide-ranging discussion that she and I were having. We hit upon the subject of affirmative action, and she allowed us how uh, she rarely, if ever, saw black students in the top half and even more rarely in the top quarter of the class at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and uh, referred to her personal experience in her own classroom where she teaches a first year required course on civil procedure, uh, not seeing at all many blacks in the upper half of the class. Uh, This produced a firestorm of protest and reaction when the video months later was discovered, circulated amongst alumni and students and other faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Law School uh, uh, and induced a a firestorm of protest, as I say, in which people demanded that she be uh, in some way or another uh, reprimanded or um, punished for having made such a slanderous and, um, you know, hurtful statements about the academic performance of African Americans at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Subsequently, and I'll be brief, her dean, Dean Ruger, uh, indeed did respond to uh, some of this criticism and removed her from the teaching of this required course. Students shouldn't be forced to take a course from her in view of the attitudes and opinions that she had expressed. Um, This is controversial. I had Amy Wax back on The Glenn Show to give an account of herself just last week, uh, pressed her in a number of ways, and I won't recapitulate that conversation. Anyone who's interested can take a look. But this is a subject that John McWhorter and I have been uh, talking about here at The Glenn Show and in our own uh, writings and so on, public speaking uh, for many years. Uh, We are both African-American professors at Ivy League institutions, and um, we uh, have our views. And so uh, I thought it would be a useful expenditure of time for us to review this case and talk about the uh, larger issues. Okay, so that's my introduction. John, if you want to add anything to that or correct anything, and then go on to say how you are uh, seeing uh, this case of uh, WAX and the more general issue of affirmative action in elite higher education. Sure. Um, I want to say at the outset that, um, I don't know, I've often been known over the years as somebody who was quote unquote against Mm -hmm. affirmative action, and I'm not. I understand that you can't just use grades and test scores in a blind manner in any kind of morally sophisticated society, but I believe that affirmative action in 2018 should be based on socioeconomic and not race. I quite explicitly believe that. I completely understand what the rationale was for basing it on race, and race really meaning black and to an extent Latino people, starting in the late 1960s. That made perfect sense. Back then, it was inaccurate but useful to think of being black as essentially being poor, because that was much closer to what the situation was. And I certainly think that for about a generation, racial preferences of the good old-fashioned kind made sense. But I do believe that Sometime in the 1990s, we needed to start extending this paradigm to socioeconomics. And yes, that would mean that affluent and even many middle class black and Latino people would not get preferences. And we've talked about 
that before. And I want to specify one more thing, and I'm not going to spend this whole thing specifying and hedging, but I want people to know exactly where I'm coming from. I wrote a book called Losing the Race almost 20 years ago now, where I argued against racial preferences as they had played out in University of California schools. And I wrote specifically, and Glenn, you did not always like what I wrote about students at UC Berkeley and what racial preferences really were like in terms of how they played out for me as a professor, seeing rather strikingly different performance overall, not completely, but there was a, clearly a generality between black students and the others. I, I'm, I'll be done in a second. And I want to make it clear that the way racial preferences were being done before the late 90s at a school like Berkeley was one where there really was a two-tier system. And a great many professors admitted to me that they had perceived it in private, but certainly we're not going to go on the record. It was clear. Anybody who listening to me now goes back to losing the race and says, well, th these are his views, must know that, yes, they were. But I was writing about a situation which I think many people today, especially under about 40, would be surprised at. I teach at Columbia University now. I would not have any of those things to say about students at Columbia. If there are racial preferences here, and I genuinely don't know if there are, they do not create any kind of difference that I have perceived. I think that at the top Ivies, as has often been said, whatever preferences there are do not create anything like the kind of difference I was writing about at Berkeley, and many people were about 20 years ago. So that must be clear, yes. I did write Losing the Race. I wrote about a stark difference that I think was harmful to the black students there. But that was nothing like the sort of thing that I think many people are familiar with today. So Berkeley, 25 years ago, that's quite different from anything that I'm teaching in now. But I do think that preferences today should be based on socioeconomics rather than race. Glenn, I think you agree with that. Is that your, is that your position? Yeah, that's not... Uh, how I would have described my position, although I don't disagree with the disquiet about affirmative action. I, I think, and I'll, I want to get on a, I want to do this in some kind of order, and I, and I do want to talk about my views about affirmative action, but just to respond to you directly, I, I also want to talk about Amy Wax, just to respond to you directly, I think that there are some circumstances in which you won't be able to get, quote, an adequate number, close quote, of African Americans um, if you base affirmative action strictly on socioeconomic status, because uh, you know there are a lot of higher test scoring, lower socioeconomic status whites, uh, and uh, if you run the numbers, I mean this is a somewhat dated analysis, but Bill Bowen and Derek Bach in their book *The Shape of the River* that's uh, 1998, okay, so it's 20 years old, uh, did run the numbers. And they're looking at, you know, something like two and a half or three percent of the class coming in being black if you're uh, abandoning explicitly racial affirmative action at the most selective colleges and universities. And that's probably not an acceptable number from a, both a political and from the university's perception of what their pedagogic goals might be. So... So I wouldn't throw all affirmative action by race out the window. And the way I would put it is um, you have to calibrate by trading off the representation goals that you're seeking against the consequences of admitting students with radically different standards of preparation. Evidently, your Berkeley of the late 1990s or the early aughts was a place where the calibration was off the charts to uh, aggressive affirmative action so that the disparity in preparation between the students was so noticeable that you were disturbed by it. Evidently, Definitely. what's happening at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, at least according to Professor Wax, is similarly miscalibrated to the extent that the disparity in performance after admission is so great. But evidently, your experience today at Columbia University, and I would say my experience today amongst my undergraduate students at Brown University, is that whatever the degree of affirmative action that's being employed, if any, it doesn't leave the African-American students in a situation where there is a gross and obvious 
uh, disparity in the extent of the no, uh, of these all. young no. people preparation. So, so I, but I don't want to equivocate because I have some deep issues with affirmative action and I want us to get to that, but I want us also to talk about the Amy Wax issue and I'll stop because I want to hear from you, John. You did, in fact, use your experience with students and your own teaching experience in that 2000 book of yours, Losing mm-hmm. the Race. Amy Wax did something similar back in September of 2017 here on The Glenn Show when she spoke about her experience with students. And the question arises, her experience with students and the observation she makes about the performance of African-American students, the question arises as to whether one violates some kind of ethical uh, restraint. You know, one one goes uh, afoul, uh, crosses a line somewhere if one stands up having been in a classroom with students and is then prepared to say, well, you know, my black students on the whole just haven't been that good. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but they just haven't been that good, and I worry that their their performance is uh, below some below par in in a way that is uh, obvious to people and injurious to perhaps the students themselves. Uh, what do you say about that? Did you see the uh, conversation I had with Amy in which she made these comments? I would have imagined you did. What what is your impression? What what is your reaction to uh, what she had to say, and how do you relate it to what you had to say back in uh, you know back at the turn of the 21st century? Yeah, um, that's a good question. When I talked about the performance disparity, what I meant, and this quite understandably got lost, you know, in the kind of crossfire that there was. I think many people today, maybe about under 40, would be surprised at how if you go back that far, the main issue in terms of, you know, the soul patrol and whether or not you were a good black thinker was affirmative action. Today, that's been replaced by issues of police brutality. But back then, affirmative action was the thing that you talked about. And I mentioned what I mentioned, not in order to get a job at a conservative think tank. or A lot of people genuinely thought that I wrote it in order to make money on the speaking circuit and things like that. I wrote it because I was making an argument that the reason that a school like Berkeley had to create that two-tiered class was because the students and their parents had not yet gotten to the point of being prepared to really hit the highest notes in grades and test scores, and that that was not because of some moral failing and certainly not some cognitive failing, but because Jim Crow was relatively recent and that the parents and the students hadn't yet acquired the skills, the cultural capital, as it's often put, that are required to be obsessive enough about schoolwork in order to get into a school like Berkeley. And I wrote about a kind of a disconnect from the school thing, as you might call it, which was a natural and understandable response to segregation, to the fact that when schools were desegregated in the 50s and 60s, black students were often quite mistreated by white teachers and white students. So naturally, you would disidentify. And I said that if we're going to get beyond those things, although they're not black people's fault, to just lower requirements for black people ends up preserving black students and families in the same sorts of patterns because there's no incentive to learn to do what, say, stereotypically a Chinese or a Korean immigrant, you know, immigrant family do for their kids. That was that was my point. Now, this is the Amy issue. It seems to me that, and I'm not trying to do some sort of psychobiography of Amy Wax, but when Amy talks about these things, I think a lot of people might wonder. Why are you pointing it out? And so, okay, you know, and I think we're going to talk about whether or not her claims are accurate. But let's say, just for now, let's say that what she's talking about is an accurate generality that, sure, there'll be exceptions, but that she's not crazy. The question is, why are you saying this? Now, the last thing I want to say is that she's saying this in order to curry favor with, you know, white conservative think tanks, et cetera, et cetera. That was lobbed at me enough. And I do know Amy and, you know, there's nothing nefarious about her. So but why do you think she's if saying she it? Doesn't, if she doesn't say why, then people are going to wonder, what, what are you going for? So I'm hoping, for example, that she might be saying this. Say maybe she's thinking of my argument that these students will only learn if their families absolutely have to do what the other ones do. But the problem is this. It seems to me, and maybe I could be wrong, but at the level of UPenn's law school, we're not talking about the sort of thing that I saw among undergraduates at Berkeley. We're talking about people where there's as much as a 99 percent bar passage rate. And so the question becomes, What's the problem with, let's say, most black students not being in the top half of the class? Why? 
And if Amy doesn't specify why she's pointing it out, and if she just keeps repeating that what she's saying is factually true and that her detractors have not given her any countervailing data, then it almost looks like she's saying, and I can be quite sure she's not saying this, but it ends up looking like she's saying that the black students just aren't smart enough and we need to arrange things so that we stop pretending that they aren't. And so that's what a lot of people will see her as saying if she doesn't couch this message in a way that sounds constructive. And you would assume that if she has this message, there would be something constructive about it. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, let, let, me, let me answer for her. Uh, I mean, there's a meta conversation here about we ask why. So a person makes a statement, it might be accurate, it might be inaccurate. But our inquiry goes not to the accuracy of the statement, but to the motivations for having made it. And we could have a long conversation about whether or not that's a legitimate way to engage in an argument. You know, it's ad hominem in a certain way. But I want to put that to the side for a moment and just answer you directly on Amy Wax's behalf, because we've talked, she and I, about this. Why? I think she'd say something like the following. She'd first say, the comments that I made about the students at Penn Law School were given as an example in the context of a broader discussion of affirmative action. So I was not specifically motivated by anything about Penn Law. I just happened to make reference to that in support of a broader point. The broader point was affirmative action pressures on institutions to get diversity often ignore the fact that the qualifications of the protected classes of black and Latino, let's say, um, are not the same, that they're not as many qualified people. And as a consequence, when an institution doesn't get its numbers up to the diversity and inclusion committee's desired you know, goal, the institution gets accused of not being inclusive, of being racist, of being discriminatory, of not wanting to include black people in its midst. She gave the example in our conversation of a uh, hospital, uh, a, a medical, um, you know, academic medical uh, complex needing a chief of radiology and the committee, the diversity uh, police, the diversity patrol, uh, uh, reprimanding the, the uh, hiring uh, group for not having any black candidates in its list of people that they were going to go after. And she was saying, well, but if you search the nation and you look for a qualified radiologist who's African-American and capable of being chief of medicine at a UPenn medical school or something like that, there aren't any or they're very, very few. And they're already at Harvard or Cornell. So in that context, she said, so, Glenn, we just have to face certain facts, like, for example, at Penn Law, et cetera, et cetera. In my experience, there are very few blacks at topic. So her motivation was to allow alternative explanations for the paucity of African-Americans in very selective venues, alternatives to the presumption that the institution is not open or inclusive, a primary alternative being that there aren't enough qualified African-Americans to go around, so not everybody is going to be able to have their quota. Now, on the question of whether she thinks that they're not up to it, well, at some level, obviously, she does think they're not up to it in the sense that they're not performing. Whether she thinks that's intrinsic to their genetic or other inheritance, you know, whether she's going there, she said nothing to indicate that that's what she thinks. I don't, frankly, know what she thinks about that. I don't want to speak for her in that regard. But it feels to me like if someone says, you know, we don't have many black students in the law school who are doing well. And then someone says, well, you must think blacks are genetically inferior. It's that latter speaker who needs to give an account for himself or herself. Why do you impute that belief to someone who simply pointed out what is or is not a fact? So, so I, I'd say that. Uh, but, but I do want to credit, and I think even she would credit. I know I'm talking for a long time, John, and I'll, I'll let you go on. But there are difficult issues here. I do want to credit the idea that some kinds of conversations compel us to invoke this ad hominem kind of query. Why is that person saying that? So let me give an example. And this is an example I used in discussion with Amy Wax last week. We have a big city. We have a precinct, uh, a police precinct commander, and he's being interviewed on the news about crime in the city. And the police precinct commander says on the news for everybody in the city to hear, I regret this. 
Uh, but I'm here to tell you, as a matter of fact, most of the crime in this city is committed by blacks. You don't like racial profiling? Well, I'm here to tell you, most of the violent criminals in this city are black. Most of the homicides in this committee are perpetrated by blacks. A lot of the robberies, way disproportionate to their number in the population, are perpetrated by blacks. When we police uh, on the streets at late at night in dangerous neighborhoods, you know who we're afraid of? They're blacks. Now, that police commander might be stating facts. Yeah. <laughs> A, a series of things are going to happen. One is she or he are going to be fired from their job. OK, mm -hmm. another is Black Lives Matter is going to be in the streets in the bucket low complaining about racism in the police department. Another is policing is going to be made less effective in that city by that police commander having said that. And if it were a gratuitous remark, if he said it for no reason other than to be able to say it, we would have to think much less well of him than if that remark were somehow relevant to some broader context of, uh, of a public discussion uh, that, uh, you know, someone said, for example, well, you know, there's a whole lot more white violent crime than there is black violent crime. And then he answered, well, no, that's not true. Actually, there are more black violent criminals. Not that that's especially relevant or whatever. That would be different from him just going out on a limb uh, and, you know, uh, gratuitously and, and almost flippantly pushing that into people's faces. So you, I think you could say that one wants to be careful. There's a reason why we don't say everything we think in public about a lot of issues, and it's called civility. We, we want to maintain everyone's confidence that the conversation is not uh, somehow a threat to their very existence or their, uh, to their dignity uh, or their self-respect, something like that. But I think Amy would answer, the reason I'm saying it is because everyone is accusing these institutions of being racist, and that's not correct. Let's get it right. The institutions are not necessarily racist. The problem is there are not enough qualified people of color to fill all of these positions. Okay, and you know, most of what you're saying, I mean, these things are, are true, and it's unfortunate that they're true. You can, we can call it generically the, the black radiologist example. There are times when a committee searches and there just aren't very many black candidates for what could be any number of reasons. It could be legacy of segregation. It could be just the luck of the draw that year. It could be that for one reason or another, culturally, black people may be less interested in A than in B or than C. Sometimes there isn't such a black person. And I don't know, in my general you know, career and just looking at how things happen, certainly very good thinking people often end up going for, say, the black candidate because they think of it as the right thing to do, when maybe they shouldn't have. I mean, even in my own world, I'm not going to specify who, but I have seen that happen in linguistics where there was a top rated position in a very top rated department where a black person got the job. This was long enough ago that I know saying this, I'm not going to give it away. A black person got the job who transparently was not as good as the other three people. And I heard from two of the other three people that they kind of presented it. And that person had a hard time getting tenure. That person's career has been quite mediocre. Or to atone for what I just said about that person, me. Cornell hired me as a fresh-faced 27-year-old out of Stanford. I was hopelessly underqualified. I'm an autodidact, and so I had taught myself only what I needed to know. I wasn't really a good linguist yet. Some people say I'm not now. And I was hired <laughs> basically because they had money for a black candidate and because I'm well-spoken, and they thought that it was the right thing to do to bring me along, and I made a bit of a fool of myself, especially with the grad students to this day. Wow. I'm sure people now who I taught at Cornell back in 1994 and 95, who have seen me sounding off about affirmative action and say, well, that's a little ironic given, you know, his seminar, wow. our mocking grammar. So I've been through it myself, openly admit it. So yes, all of that is real, but I think Amy chose an unfortunate example and then using her class or classes as a demonstration, because once again, if where she is, the fact that affirmative action happened didn't matter in terms of the future performance of these students out in the world, say, in passing the bar exam. If it really had no particular impact, then I think she would have been advised to consider that 
for example, I'm sitting here referring to something that happened 25 or 30 years ago, and even now I'm, I'm cringing because some people who know me might know who I'm talking about. She's talking about people who are sitting in her chairs right now. And so I don't want to say, God damn it, she brought it upon herself, because I know that she was just trying to make a point, and I imagine she wasn't thinking about what the consequences would have been. I mean, certainly, when you're doing a video blog, you don't feel like you're writing and, you know, we're all new to this social media business. There are many things I've said to you here that I would never put in print. And I'm, you're not sure who's exactly listening. So she got kind of surprised. But the question still is, why, in the case of her classes, does it matter? And I, I disagree with you slightly in that, given the nature of it, we're talking about people sitting in chairs, working their butts off in law school, who she's standing in front of. If she doesn't explain why she's bringing it up very clearly. And in this case, the fact that there's the black radiologist example isn't going to go through for many people because it doesn't seem as crucial. If she doesn't explain, there's this big hollowness. It's just, it's as if there's an arched eyebrow that she didn't intend that's going to leave a lot of people thinking, if she doesn't say why this matters, then is she basically communicating why it matters without saying it? Because we know that there are people like that. And that is what's alarming okay john uh, by the way that confession of yours about you're making a fool of yourself at cornell university because you had been hired as an affirmative action hire you weren't quite ready for prime time you are now but you weren't then uh let us be clear about that uh that's quite a that's quite a tale man well uh, i can and, tell it uh, because it's been so long but yes, I know what that's like. And I'm not uh, saying affirmative action is wrong because of how it, how it makes the beneficiary feel. But still, these things definitely happen. And they're done by very normal, well-meaning people who have no idea of the larger implications. So, Well, yeah. I mean, let me point out that there was somebody else who might have wanted to take that job uh, oh, that you got. Sure. And that person has got a beef, right? They, they, and um, after the fact, when they see you falling on your face, I mean, they've got even more of a beef. They're saying, oh, you I see know there? Who, I know who would have gotten that job, and so did a lot of people, and he was much better than me. Some people would say he s still is, and it's absurd <laughs> that he did not get that job. It was wrong. It was so long ago now that, you know, we can talk about it. But that's how these things go. All right, John, we're back. Uh, slight interruption, but in any case... Uh, what was the last thing you said? Do you remember? I think I was saying that I was a transparent affirmative action hire at Cornell and okay. it shouldn't have happened. And so basically we were just saying that, yes, there is the black radiologist. And it's not that there's just some of that. That does extend its fingers throughout society. It's a general philosophy about hiring of black and I think brown people. But I was just saying that, well, still, maybe... Amy didn't choose the most felicitous example in choosing her present tense classes as an example, simply because it's not clear that it matters. And so to hire a less qualified black person because you think that it makes you look good. Yeah, there's a there's a problem with that, especially because people tend to re refuse to admit that that's what happened. OK, but well, for classes, what's the problem? Here's an example of where it might matter. Judges are looking for clerks. They tend, according to Amy Wax, and I have heard no one contradict this, to be very concerned about hiring of Supreme mm -hmm. Court justice, a, a federal appeals court judge, about hiring law clerks who are at the top of their law school classes. They want young people who are crackerjack legal analysts, people who are Able, quick studies who are able to absorb large amounts of written material uh, associated with the cases that come before these courts and relate them to the law and help to draft briefs, uh, I should say opinions, that the judges will ultimately sign off on that will become law. And they want the brightest students. They want to hire from the top of the class. They're concerned about grades. Now, if it turns out that African Americans are uh, being admitted to the law school with lower um, academic qualifications, lower GPA in college, lower performance on the test scores, that doesn't have to mean that they're stupid, but it might mean that they're not prepared for whatever the reasons might be. And there could be many historical and social and cultural reasons why. And if the culture of affirmative action forbids one to 
discuss the differences in the performance of students after they've been admitted, given that they have been admitted with a different standard, then that forces a kind of dishonesty onto the entire conversation. I mean, you have to avoid saying things that people know to be true. There just aren't so many crackerjack legal analytic minds amongst the African Americans matriculating at these law schools. Now, I'm not a law professor. I don't know that that's the case, but I can read the statistics just like anybody else, the analyses of the test score, the statistical correlations of entry qualifications with uh, the subsequent grades and so forth. You say, why does it matter? Um, (laughs) The old saw does anybody know Johnny Cochran's LSAT score? Yeah, you know, Johnny Cochran, now deceased, he was the, the attorney who got O.J. Simpson off back in 1995 or whenever it was, and he was a pretty good attorney. You would have to give him that. Uh, and uh, whether or not he scored high or scored low on some paper and pencil tests would seem to be largely irrelevant. And a person might say that this is more broadly true. Uh, This uh, focus on test scores and even on grades uh, is excessive and, you know, kind of fetishizing um, and that what we should really be looking at is the long arc of the careers that people have who are admitted under affirmative action and so forth. Bowen and Bach in that book that I've mentioned, Shape of the River, make a point. The data that they have allows them to follow students who've been admitted to elite universities and colleges for 15 years after they've graduated. And they make a point of stressing that these careers look pretty good in terms of people with succeeding, making partner, getting advanced degrees, uh, making civic contributions to their communities and so forth and so on. It may be true that Michelle Obama benefited at Princeton from affirmative action when she was admitted, but she hasn't done too badly in life, some people would say, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, why does it matter? And I think it does matter, John. Actually, I, I really do. I think a couple of things, and I want to hear your opinions about this. I think it matters for the institutions because, by the way, grades and test scores are the way that we decide which blacks to admit. Just like we decide which whites and which Asians to admit based on grades and test scores. I mean, I find it an odd argument that grades and test scores don't matter for interracial differences. Why would we emphasize grades? And yet they're the only thing that matters for intra-racial differences. Let an African-American who doesn't uh, perform so well uh, and who... um, comes from a a poor socioeconomic background, show up at an Ivy League school and say, that upper middle class black that you just admitted with a 200 point lower combined SAT score compared to the average white, well, my SAT score is 200 points lower than his, but I deserve that seat. That argument is not going to fly. That argument is not going anywhere. You want, quote, the best, close quote, of the minority applicants to be the ones that you admit. So do grades and test scores matter or don't they? (laughs) That, that's one kind of point. But another kind of point is, don't we learn something about the pre-application educational development of these populations from the fact that there are such large disparities in the quality of the applications that they're submitting, that affirmative action is a necessary intervention to secure a sufficient number of blacks? Isn't there a problem before the, the admissions process actually takes place? which is being buried or avoided to the extent that we say test scores don't matter. Let's just get an adequate number of African-Americans. And I'll conclude with this. So one point is intra-racial discrimination depends on the test. How come it doesn't matter when you're talking about interracial differences? The other point is the tests are informative. They're not, these are not random things. These are things that are telling us what developmental uh, accomplishments have been uh, made by the people who are taking the test. Um, But the final thing that I want to say is, my God, we're 40 years on with affirmative action, 50 years. We're 50 years on with affirmative action. Are African-Americans really content to make our stand here? Our stand being we want equality and inclusion in American society, and we insist that you treat us in a uh, deferential way in order to achieve it. We insist that you not judge us the way you judge Uh, non-white immigrant uh, applicants from Southeast Asia, the way you judge uh, uh, lower class white applicants from uh, Appalachia, don't treat us that way. 
We're black. Our ancestors have been enslaved. We suffered Jim Crow. Racism is a real phenomenon. White privilege continues to exist. Look the other way at our relative lack of uh, preparation and, and accomplishment when we, when we uh, uh, compete. This is competition. Not everybody is going to get in. Uh, Brown admits one out of 14 applicants, if I'm not mistaken. So it's already highly selective. Do we really want to take a stand in the 21st century uh, on a political ground and not on a ground of objective accomplishment? Um, I'm not saying this in order to let any white person off the hook. I'm not saying this on behalf of Amy Fisher or somebody who got rejected at a school because of affirmative. I'm saying this on behalf of black people. Really? You're content? to make your case on the basis of affirmative, don't take our affirmative action away, you're a racist because you wanna take our affirmative action away, rather than making your case on the basis of, I have mastered the curriculum, I am in command of the material, I am very good at what I do. You can't keep me out because I'm very good at what I do. We don't wanna be very good at what we do, now people are gonna get mad at me, but you need to look at those scores, those scores, the gap in those scores is humongous. It's telling us something about the underdevelopment of our people. End of, end of my sermon. And Glenn, I, I want to, as always, I mean, what, I understand what you're saying, but we also have to try to get into the heads of the people who have just listened to you and thought that you were somehow crazy or you were somehow missing something. And I will never forget something that a very bright girl said to me at UC Berkeley, and it was a while ago now, but I don't think it was completely irrelevant. I think that there is a part of many, especially black observers of this sort of thing, and I think a lot of white fellow travelers feel the same way too, deep down, which is that beyond a certain point, black people making really tippy tippy top grades and scores is irrelevant because there are other things that are more important to being a thinking or aware black person. I think there's a subtle issue of identity. I'll never forget. It's, it's, it's rare. It's kind of like you find a dinosaur fossil by accident because a little part of a knuckle happens to be protruding above ground, but you're not usually going to see it. This girl, she was a black <laughs> undergraduate. I should say black woman, not girl. She was about 20 years old, and she had been working in the office helping to recruit black undergraduates to Berkeley. Her job was to you know, help walk black students around who were prospectives and to help bring black students into Berkeley. Wonderful. So once um, preferences had been banned, and during this spring, there's this huge protest that if you ban the preferences, then you're going back to segregation, et cetera, et cetera. I wrote about this in Losing the Race. I was talking to this girl about what was going on. And this was before I had written the book, before anybody knew that I had any you know, views of my own as a black person. So we were just talking about it. And she said something really important. I said, so how's it going with recruitment? And she said, oh, well, we're, we're really worried. And I said, well, is it that there just don't seem to be any black students who qualify under the new rules? And she said, oh, no, no, it's not that. She said this straight out. I'll never forget it. She said, and she wasn't a dramatic type, she just said it. She said, but what we're worried about is that black students who perform at that high level aren't going to be concerned with there being a black community at Berkeley. She said it straight out. And what she meant was that if you have black students who really are, you know, performing like Chinese or Korean American students, then they're not going to be really black. They might not like black people. They might not really be concerned with having mostly black friends. They're going to date white people. They're not really black. Her assumption was, and I don't think she had thought it through, but her assumption was that anybody who was that much of a grind was not going to be what she thought of as an authentic black person. And she didn't say it with a frown either. I found, I found that very articulate in its way because I think that a lot of that cuts through why so many black people and white fellow travelers are comfortable saying, we fought to be equals, now you better treat us as unequal or we're gonna call you a racist. The idea is that beyond a certain point, you're not a real black person if you're doing that well. Now, of course, nobody would say that overtly. And I think most people accused of it will resist. That's, that's natural. However, I don't think that that means that that isn't part of the philosophy. And these are hard things to get at. And it brings me to Amy. So, for example, let's say that part of the problem is what these clerks are saying off the record. The problem is, and why these things are difficult, is that if all of that is only hearsay, that doesn't mean it isn't true. 
but it means that one, you better have heard it a lot. It better be real hearsay. And two, you've got to stress that, I would think, if you're going to talk about this performance problem, because once again, people are going to ask, why are you saying this? What's the point? What are you trying to help? That would be something very valuable to bring up or and something we haven't talked about. I don't know if this is a problem at the level of you, Penn, but elided in a lot of this discussion has been the work of, say, Richard Sander back in the aughts when he oh, did who? the work of who? I'm sorry. Richard Sander. Oh, Remember yeah. OK. Richard yeah. Rick Sander. Yeah. Study where he studied what I believe was tens of thousands of law students over a broad swath of schools, not just a few selective ones over a long period of time. And he made what was really an impregnable argument that students who were um, admitted to schools beyond their qualifications suffered because overall they had strikingly low rates of passage of the bar, or at least had to try two and three times. Whereas if they had gone to schools where the teaching were more at the pace that they were used to because of their modest preparation, then they would have been better prepared to pass the bar. And he was making the argument that affirmative action in law schools lowers the number of black lawyers. Now, this is what's important about Sanders' study. Of course, the usual suspects wanted to dismiss him. And the fact is, they didn't succeed. And this was a time when I was paying close attention to things like this. I think a lot of people read something by Emily Bazelon, who I admire very much, but I think she missed the boat on the Sanders study. There was a law review. I honestly forget which law review that actually solicited six responses to Sander where people attempted to tear him to pieces. If you it's read the, the Stanford, it's Stanford University Stanford, uh, Law School. Stanford Law School. Wonderful thing about law reviews is how clearly they tend to be written so that somebody who isn't a legal theorist can actually read the work. I read every word. And I admit I had a little bit of a bias, but I could not see how Sander had been destroyed by this analysis. It was people waving their hands, waving away what they found to be inconvenient data. And even more recently, um, Peter Archidiakono, I'll bet he says Archidiakono, Peter Archidiakono and somebody else whose name I forget, did a study of scientists making a similar conclusion about, I think it was four years ago, that with this overplacement, this mismatch, as it's called, the reason you want to talk about it is not just because, well, damn it, there's a mismatch and it's not fair, but there's a mismatch and it means that there are fewer black scientists and they weren't even expecting to find that. And so yeah. these are things that are real and I'm let, sure that they're in the Let me, what Amy excuse said. me, I, I just want to uh, uh, add a couple of footnotes. Uh, Sanders' study, published in the 2004 Stanford Law Review, was based upon the Law School Admissions Council data from, I think, the year is 1991. It's the early 90s. They have the universe of applicants. Everyone who applied to a law school who had to take the law school admissions test is included in this sample. And he was able to differentiate between elite law schools and less selective law schools. Yes, that's right. And he was able to analyze not only bar passage rates, but to relate that to the uh, grade performance of students when they came into the law school, finding that African Americans were clustered at the bottom of their classes in the elite law schools in those years. And that the fact that they were so clustered was negative, had a negative effect on their bar passage rates. And he ended up with the conclusion that if you didn't have affirmative action, uh, the number of blacks going to law school would probably not fall that much. They'd just go to different schools, schools that were less selective, where they'd be better matched. And according to his analysis, their passage rates would be higher. Now, the critics, I think there were some statistical arguments against his conclusion that you'd actually have more black lawyers if you didn't have affirmative action. But nobody was able to disprove the claims that he was making about, A, the huge disparity in the qualifications of kids coming into law school by race, and B, the consequential differences in the rates at which they were performing, the uh, uh, levels at which they were performing uh, post-admission. And the numbers are really shocking. It's something like, I don't know, three quarters of African-American students in the bottom fifth the lower two deciles of the grade distribution after the first year in the elite schools in the early 1990s. And the other footnote I want to add is on Peter Arcidia Diacano, is how I would have said it, but Arcidia, I don't know how to say it, but Peter at Duke. Mm -hmm. What they did, they're looking at the Duke University data, and they're looking at kids who have come into the university and majored in the sciences and engineering. 
Um, and uh, there are dropouts, people who switch their major before they finish getting their degrees out of the sciences and engineering and into the social sciences, sociology or the humanities. And he and he was saying there's no racial difference coming in in the rate at which black and white kids want to get degrees in the sciences and engineering. But the dropout rate for the black students is much higher from the sciences switching over to non-technical fields. And he says that disparity is entirely explained by the differences in their entry level test scores. So that if you compared black and white students with the same qualifications coming in, they had very similar rates of switching out of the sciences. But because the qualification differences were so great due to affirmative action, the result was that black students who might have gotten degrees in physics or chemistry or electrical engineering at another university where they were better matched end up uh, not getting those degrees in the sciences at all. This was what Justice Antonin Scalia infamously was referring to when he made reference in the context of this University of Texas case, the Amy Fisher case, that uh, how do we know that uh, blacks wouldn't be, there wouldn't be more scientists and engineers if they didn't go to such fancy schools. Everyone got mad at him, Justice Scalia, for seeming to suggest that blacks weren't fit to be scientists and engineers, but in fact, he was saying something quite different. So thank you for allowing me that extent. I just thought, I thought we ought to get the record straight. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah. a little more about Sander, because I, I'm afraid that the response to our bringing that up is gonna be of a certain caliber that I hope it won't. I watched Sander give a quiet presentation of his ideas at Turo Law School um, near here in New York City back in 2005. And they had it set up so that it was him, and then they had two respondents to him. One of them was a black law professor, I imagine she was in her, in her 50s, you know, seasoned person, who sat there and actually compared him to William Shockley, the person who talked about black people having lower IQs. That's and awful. just looked at him and peacefully, you know, called him that as if this was the most morally impregnable charge in the world. And Sander, frankly, is not a firebrand. And then there was this young representative from the NAACP who got up and gave one of the most repulsive orations I have ever heard. Her sneering tone, I sneer, was absolutely repulsive to me. She sat there and said, there you go, Richard Sander, making references to your biracial son when you actually want to exclude all of these students of color from, of color from law school. Just, just repulsive. And that was what he was up against. And poor Sander sat there, I don't know how he did it, had this little smile on his face, pretending that all of this was a civil debate. He didn't deserve that. And the saddest thing is that that is the kind of response that many people will have to the two studies that you just so perfectly described. And I don't think that it's empirical. I mean, frankly, that is Galileo's inquisitors. That is religiously anti-empirical to refuse to face data like that in any way. And once again, that means, I assume Amy knows about this sort of response to things like this. And so part of the reason she's in such hot water is because she is dealing to an extent with Galileo's inquisitors. Yeah. You know, back in the day, and I, I've been around for a while, John, I remember the late 70s and the early 80s. I remember when Nathan Glazer published his book, Affirmative Discrimination. This was the sociologist at Harvard, a very sweet man, uh, a decent man, and a progressive, politically oriented person. This is Nathan Glazer, the sociologist. Why are you referring to him in the past tense? Do I not? Oh, no, I, I do not know. I don't know whether he's living or not. I certainly hope that he's oh, living. Right. At, that's not what I meant. I just meant that this okay. is the late 70s to early yeah. 80s. That's all I okay. meant. Um, and there was a furious uh, firestorm against this uh, gentle and decent person who simply was raising some questions um, about affirmative action. Um, and I remember when Harvey Mansfield published his essay called The Underhandedness of Affirmative Action. This would have been about 1982, 1981. Okay. But you can find it. It was in the National Review. It's a, it's a classic period piece, this essay where he, he, he calls to our attention something I think is true and has been borne out by the last 35 years of experience, which is affirmative action is a deeply subversive policy. And, and here's what he means. He, it, it undermines a whole lot of stuff because 
you're going to end up in this uh, position of having this conversation about how come you're putting so much emphasis on uh, brain power? How, how come you, you know, it's like a cult of smartness. You, you think that everybody who gets their position as a partner in a law firm is smarter than everybody else? Stuff like that. You end up with, OK, maybe the subject is too mathematical. You know, women and blacks are not necessarily as strong in math. Maybe we should tone down the degree of mathematics in the subject in order to accommodate the students who are here. You end up with stuff like, OK, this one got a 4.0, this one got a 3.2. What difference does it make, really? Uh, you end up with stuff like uh, the acting white thing that you were referring to earlier, which is that authenticity and a commitment to the cause means that you have to eschew a certain kind of elitism which is ridiculous since affirmative action is almost by definition an elitist policy. I mean, I, I want to emphasize this. And, and I was referring to it a bit earlier. Amongst the African-Americans who are benefiting from preferential admissions in very selective venues, they're the creme de la creme of the African-American population seeking to be included within the creme de la creme of the broader societal uh, social order. If there weren't hierarchy, there'd be no need for affirmative action. Affirmative action is parasitic on pre-existing inequality. These places, like I say, Brown admits one in 14 applicants. That is hyper selectivity. The whole game is based upon us being included in the hyper selective chosen elites. Okay, so it is not a democratic policy. It's an elitist policy. You just want to spread the elitism around, around in a racially egalitarian way. And any serious philosopher could pick that one apart, it seems to me, without much effort, could expose the internal contradictions and the dishonesty. That's an implicit uh, part of this debate. So I, I just want to reiterate my point, which is, my God, we're in the 21st century where a half century past the civil rights movement really is a way of life permanently and ongoing forever. We African-Americans are going to depend for our inclusion within the most selective venues in the society upon a special dispensation based upon the suffering of our ancestors. <laughs> really? Is that what is that what you call equality? That's not equality. And everybody knows it. And I'll just conclude. People are bluffing. When they come out with this, these histrionics, oh, you just said that I was stupid. You just said that, it, that you just bought the Charles Murray uh, argument about uh, how we're intellectually inferior. They're bluffing because that's not the claim. The claim is you didn't learn how to do calculus well enough to get into Caltech. That, that's the claim. And that's actually, unfortunately, too often true. OK, so if you make uh, if you pillory Amy Wax and her ilk, you're going to end up with a lot of data on the table that you don't want to see. Data that actually follow objectively the performance of people and assess them according to neutral criteria and find African-Americans too often wanting. If we don't address the fundamental underlying developmental problem, more people with a command over calculus that lets them get into the engineering school at Northwestern University or Cornell, if we don't address that problem, we're not going to get equality. We're going to get being patted on the head. You know something, Glenn? I just want to, I want to just insert this because it's interesting. You mentioned Charles Murray. You know, about a month ago, I was on the train and a semi-disturbed, I think, black gentleman was doing a rant in between asking for money. And you know, he mentioned Charles Murray. That's how deeply these things permeate society. Oh, that's amazing. He said, if I may, I don't know if I'm going to get bleeped, and he said, and Charles Murray can suck my dick. And oh, I'm, John. Why is he talking about Charles Murray? So that is how deeply these things permeate. Oh, <laughs> John. So actually, yeah, go ahead. It. it was right in front of me. I don't think he was talking to me. But also, <laughs> the... Um, you talk about this um, orthodoxy, because <laughs> this really happened, is that I loved a line that we used to get from about 2002 until, no, 2000 until 2008 on affirmative action as the discussion of that was waning. I used to love this. This would come from whites. Whites would say when they thought that they were arguing for us. They would say, well, why do test scores and grades matter so much when George W. Bush is president? Right. 
And everybody, you know, people would snap their fingers and think of this as a great point. And I started anticipating that point when I would do talks on this. And I would say, and I don't want to hear anything about George W. Bush, because why in the world would we want to compare ourselves to him? And why would you, if you're speaking for black people, want to compare us to George W. Bush? Don't you see the insult? And as as recalcitrant as people could be on this issue, I used to notice that would be through. But why did I have to tell them? You know, it's just the way we're often encouraged to think about this sort of thing means that you say things that you couldn't possibly genuinely mean. And it brings me to, to this, though. This is not a transition, but there's something I think we need to discuss. Amy being barred from teaching her first year classes. And you know something? You and I are going to disagree on this. I've thought hard about this one. Okay. I agree. I agree with that decision. And yeah, I agree disagree. with that decision very reluctantly because... Given what has come out, what's out there, and the way we cannot help that it will be discussed, we can't help it, we live in a world, I really do feel that a lot of black students would take classes from Amy and feel uncomfortable. They would feel like she assumed that they weren't going to do well, and I know she didn't intend that. She didn't intend that at all. But it's out there. It's on blog. It's, we have to get used to the fact that that's like writing something. It's viewable. You can see it on your phone. And I can see how black students would feel a little uncomfortable. Now, this is what's important. Here would be Claude Steele, psychologist at, I think, Stanford, stereotype threat. The idea that if you walk in with that stereotype threat hanging over you, yeah. it lowers your performance. Now, I've always thought that that was a very weak thesis in that he set students up under conditions of stereotype threat in an experiment and notices that their performance goes down. But there's never been an answer to the question as to whether real life sets you up with that stereotype threat when you're doing school. Right. Here would be a case where suddenly it was real. Now, you know what? I wish that the students wouldn't feel that way. Quite frankly, maybe because I'm strange. If I walked into a classroom, if I were a law student, and yes, if I were only 22 or 23, and I knew that the professor had said something like that, my innate maybe sense of it, my parents didn't teach me this. It's just maybe because I'm stubborn. My sense would be, I'm going to show her that that's not true. There's no way I'm going to knuckle under to that. But, you know, I don't think that that's the zeitgeist. I don't think that many black students would feel that way under today's orthodoxy. I think most of them would have in 1950. I'm thinking of black people a very long time ago where, you know, they would have assumed that professors thought that way. And the idea was, we're going to show them that that's not true. Thurgood Marshall would have understood that. We live in different times, and I think it's a regrettable aspect of these times but these students innocently are going to teach to one another that that's the way you're supposed to feel in her classroom. And as such, it might lower their performance. And it is not a smackdown to say that the grading is blind. Because before the grades happen, there's yeah, discussion in class. Yeah. And so I actually think, I don't think Amy should be, not because of penalization, but I think that frankly, if Amy were to have be allowed to continue to teach those classes, there would be endless, you know, protests. Well, against uh, I, mean, I, I don't think we agree, but let me uh, credit what you said, which is that her being out there in the way that she is poisons the well in terms of her uh, pedagogic relations with students of color in her classes, even if it doesn't adversely affect how she evaluates them, blind grading and all of that. So I take that point. And by the way, that's related to a point that uh, one of her colleagues said to me in private correspondence, and I won't name this person, but the content of it was, if she had gotten poor teaching evaluations from students, the dean well might have chosen to remove her from, to reassign her teaching. Well, massive protests from people of color that they can't countenance her in the classroom is a little bit like poor teaching evaluations, no? Let's face it. So the administrative decision to remove her could be justified purely on the basis of that. Uh, whereas I want to say, and the reason that I uh, disagreed with the dean's decision and disagree with you, and in this, to this extent support Amy Wax, is that it feels like she's being punished for having her opinions. It feels equivalent to me to if she had come out and said, I voted for Donald Trump and think he's a great president. And then a lot of students had said, I can't study with somebody like that. And that would deeply disturb me. Or if she were um, a geologist or, you know, uh, a earth scientist, a climate scientist, and she said, I disagree with the uh, uh, Paris Peace of, uh, uh, Climate Accords. 
I disagree thinking that that's bad policy. I think we should uh, mine coal anyhow because, and then there's some argument about why this person hypothetically would think that. And then someone would just say, well, you can't teach introduction geology because now you are you know, perceived by our students as being somebody who doesn't care about the planet. And uh, to me, there's that, that's a slippery slope. It, it, it disturbs me that people be taken out of their classes for having penny, opinions that students don't like. So it seems to me that there's there there's more than one side to the to the concern about uh, about I think, that. I take your point, but I think that when we're talking about something as specific as somebody who said something about performance and preparation, and therefore yeah. application intelligence, that's kind of a third rail. You and know, I she's won teaching. Excuse me for interrupting. You know, she's won twice. She's won a teaching award. Yeah, but uh, so, given by her students for her excellence uh, as a teacher in the classroom. Yeah, but. Just think of how, how this would be now. A black student could very easily, if they happen not to do well for whatever reason, claim that part of the reason was that Amy Wax made them inherently uncomfortable. And let's face it, they would be warmly supported in that by many other black students, and if only via silence, most of Amy's faculty. There would be endless situations like that. I think that, quite frankly, Amy might find it a relief not to be teaching those classes and to only teach seminars afterward. It would just create a kind of a mess that would keep all of this going even longer. I mean, really, we have to imagine our children, Glenn, going into that class. You know, I'm tempted to say I would teach Dahlia and Vanessa not to knuckle, but, you know, the truth is, who knows what their individual constitutions would be like. This person has said this about black students, and you just try your best. I don't know. Frankly, I can see how maybe it would just be better if she were relieved from teaching first year classes. Now, if she lost her job, then, frankly, I'd be screaming in the streets. But that's not what this is, even if it is a, a penalty, which obviously. All right. I don't think we agree, but it's a close call. And, and I think there's it is. considerable merit in, in what you're saying. Why don't we leave it at that, John? We've been talking for a while. Yeah, we did it, didn't we? We've done is it. there something else that you'd like to say by way of conclusion? No, I got it all in. This is this is okay. what I thought. Yeah. We're on the record, John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry, the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. We do not shrink from the difficult questions. I think you can give us that much, if nothing else. <laughs> we do, but yes, <laughs> we try. Thanks very much, John. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. okay. See you soon. Bye-bye.